once upon a time, in a mythical land, which is as far and yet near as night from day. There lived a king and queen upon whom the greatest riches of the world had been bestowed. They lived in a magnificent palace and had many servants who attended their every whim. They ate from golden plates and drank the rarest wine from elegant golden goblets. Their clothes were fashioned from fine spun silk and their shoes from the softest leather. Yet for all this, there was sorrow in their hearts. The queen especially felt a deep sadness that only the birth of a child could relieve. Yet the king and queen had been married for some time and there was no sign of a child. Each day the queen would sit beside the stream in the palace gardens weeping. I would give all my riches, she whispered into the flowing water, if only I could be graced with a child. Now it happened that on the day of the queen's seventh wedding anniversary, as she sat in her usual way, weeping beside the stream, that a slimy, wet green frog sprang from the water. Oh, queen, he croaked, hopping up onto her lap. Why do you weep so bitterly each day? Do you not know that your tears disturb the water? Put your sorrow behind you, queen, and a child will soon be born. And with that, the strange creature slid down the muddy bank and plopped back into the water. That night, the queen told the king what the frog had said. There shall be no more weeping, she announced, and she took up her flute, which she had not played for seven years. And by the light of the new white moon, she lulled her husband into the land of dreams. Within less than a year, a beautiful baby daughter was born. There was great celebration throughout the land and preparations for the child's christening party were begun. The king himself drew up the list of guests. Many important people were invited, but on the queen's request, pride of place was to be reserved for the fairies who were to be godmothers to the newborn child. Now there were 13 fairies in the land and not one was more important than another. Yet the king had only 12 golden plates in his possession and so he decided to invite only 12 of the fairies to the celebrations. Well, the day soon arrived. Flags were hoisted high above the palace and a splendid feast was prepared in the kitchens. In the great hall, the king and queen welcomed guests from all over the land. Everyone was eager to see the long-awaited princess and her proud parents were equally keen to show her off. Then, as the clock approached noon, the time when shadows rarely fall, a gentle breeze and the sound of sweet music 
filtered into the hall. Almost everyone had the feeling that the twelve fairies were about to arrive. A quiet hush settled over the gathering. Then, very, very slowly, as if a magical veil had somehow been lifted from their mortal eyes, twelve shimmering figures draped in robes of silver-blue mist, gradually came into view, hovering like butterflies above the princess's cradle. Everyone in the room looked on in wonder, apart from the king, that is, who preferred to think that the fairies must have come in through the door whilst he was blinking. Greetings were exchanged silently, as is custom upon such occasions, and without further ado, the twelve radiant figures joined hands and encircled the cradle. With heads bowed low, they studied the newborn child in deep. Now it was said that the fairies knew of ways to weave the threads of fortune into intricate patterns that the most knowledgeable of men could only guess at. And so it wasn't surprising that the silence deepened as the fairies began to sense the fate of the child. After what seemed like an eternity, but which was really only a moment, the fairy figures lifted their heads and with hands still joined, drew back from the cradle until their fingertips were just touching. Twelve wishes are bestowed this day, they declared as one voice. And as they spoke, the shimmering throng began to glide through the air around the newborn child in a stream of silver-blue light. And as each fairy passed close to the head of the cradle, she drew in from her sisters and blessed the child with a wish. Your first wish, a name. Beauty you shall be, no fairer vision in the world to see. With great good health you shall be blessed, and strength to aid you in your quest. A quiet heart and an easy mind, you shall always be gentle and kind. The grace of a dear I shall wish for thee, that you may dance a mystery for all to see. No sweeter song shall e'er be sung, forgotten dreams like echoes rung. No fear to impede you along your way, from your true path you will never stray. No mark shall you make twixt friend and foe. With faith shall you serve both high and low. A fountain of youth, the wisdom of age, these shall serve you for all your days. To the weary traveller lost in the night, shall shine like a star, a guiding light. And to those who love you, you shall become the source from which their art is spun. For all who have glimpsed you shall forever say, let me not forget you for a single day.
And so in turn, each fairy bestowed her blessing upon the newborn child. But just before the twelfth fairy was about to speak, just at the point when everyone was beginning to wonder what more the fairies could possibly wish, a howling icy wind surged suddenly through the hall and a loud crack of thunder shook the palace as if to its very foundations. The queen grabbed the screaming princess from the cradle and grasped her to her breast in terror. Yet no sooner had she done so than the howling wind whipped itself up into a raging, whirling mass. Many of the guests ran shrieking from the hall, whilst others who were too stunned to move stood quaking in their shoes. The twelve fairies withdrew silently from the cradle and exchanged glances, as if they had somehow anticipated such a turn of events. Whilst from the centre of the swirling wind, a terrifying figure, clothed in the colours of the bleakest winter's night, began to emerge. It was the thirteenth fairy, the uninvited guest, and she was wild with fury. Her black eyes roamed the room, like those of a raven searching its prey. In a flash, she was upon the king. How dare you? She hissed as she thrust an accusing finger toward him. How dare you not invite me here today? The king rushed forward to protect his wife and child as the dark figure swept violently through the air towards them. Now just a moment, he cautioned. Let us please be calm about this. There is a perfectly sensible explanation. No offence was meant. Calm? Calm? Bellowed the thirteenth fairy with so much might and fury that her silver-grey hair stood completely on end. Do you not know what you have done? Do you not know, even now, that this is not the hour for calm and sensible explanations? At this, several glass objects in the room shattered and crashed to the floor. Guards! Call the guards! ordered the king, who was by now pale with shock. I shall countenance this impostor no longer. Remove her! Remove her! Yet the thirteen fairy paid no heed. Your guards cannot save you, foolish lord, from what is rightly yours. And now is the hour you shall not forget. Now is the hour when I shall be remembered, the abandoned one, the uninvited guest, thirteenth fairy of the land. The shocked king fell to his knees and pleaded, I would have remembered you, believe me, if only but the golden plates, the golden plates, I had only twelve. Stand aside, mortal lord. Events must run their course, and I too have a wish for your daughter. And she cast her piercing eye to the tiny princess who lay sobbing in her mother's arms. For fifteen years to the very day, there will be no price to pay. But on that day when you have no care, she shall wander alone 
up a winding stair. And there in the darkness we shall meet. My task will almost be complete. Spinning wheel and silver thread, she'll be pierced by a spindle and fall down dead. This shall be your reward, O oh foolish king. This shall be the wish of the uninvited guest. And with these terrible words, the thirteenth fairy gathered her dark robes about her and swept away from the hall like a raging storm. Everyone was shocked and stunned. The queen wept bitterly as she rocked the tiny child endlessly back and forth. But just then, the twelfth fairy, who had awaited her turn patiently, now came forward and whispered to the king and queen. Do you not remember? I too have a wish to make. So calm yourselves and hear my words, for soon we must leave your mortal world. And then, Lighter than air, the misty blue figure rose high above the newborn child and spoke to the entire gathering. Although it is true what my sister has said, beauty will pierce her finger, but she'll not fall down dead. Death will not claim her, so dry your tears, instead she will sleep for one hundred years. Remember, remember, remember. The words of the twelfth fairy echoed through the hall as she gradually faded from view with her sisters and was gone. After the princess's christening party, the king ordered every last spindle in the land to be sought out and publicly burned. He assured his wife that the child was safe, for how could she ever prick her finger upon a spindle if all the spindles had been destroyed? The queen was not so sure but allowed herself to be persuaded. And so the young girl grew, with all the qualities that the fairies had wished for her. There was no kinder soul in the land, and all who knew her marvelled at her beauty. Time passed, and the day of the princess's fifteenth birthday came around. By this time, everyone had completely forgotten about spindles and wicked fairies. Yet whilst the king and queen were getting ready for the birthday celebrations, the young princess was allowed to wander the palace all alone, just as it had been foretold. Now there were several parts of the palace that the young girl had never explored. And one place in particular 
which she had often wondered about, was an ancient tower, festooned with creeping ivy, which stood at the very edge of the palace gardens. Now this high tower had only one tiny room at the very top, which the curious princess found she could reach by climbing a dusty, unlit spiral staircase. At the very top of the stair, she came to an old arched door with a rusty key in its lock. She took a deep breath, turned the key and pushed open the heavy creaking door. It was very dark inside the little room, and at first the princess saw nothing. Yet when her eyes had adjusted to the dim light, she saw an old, old woman bending over a strange-looking wheel. Come in, my dear, whispered the old woman beckoning the girl toward her. Do you know what I am doing? I do not, replied the girl. I have never seen such a contraption before. What is it? It is a spindle, my child, the only one left in the whole land, and I am spinning my fine silver thread upon it. Would you like to try? Well, the princess was fascinated by the strange contraption and was eager to try herself. Yet no sooner had she sat down to spin than she pricked her finger and fell down upon the cold stone floor. The old woman picked her up and lay her upon the bed in the centre of the room. Now in that same moment, the king and queen, who had just arrived in the great hall, fell instantly to sleep on their thrones. All the guests who had been arriving fell to sleep as they spoke. The servants, who were busy preparing the birthday feast, fell asleep at their work. The royal horses fell asleep in their stables, the dogs in the yard, and even the flies on the wall. was not a living thing in the whole palace that remained awake, for all that was mortal slipped into a deep and dreamless river of sleep. And in that same instant, the sun darkened and faded from the skies, and a dense forest of cruel thorns encircled the entire palace. For one hundred years all was lost and hidden from view. Remember, remember, remember. And so the years passed by all unknowingly. And many of those who lived within sight of the forest grew old and died pondering its mystery. Yet those who lived on the very edge of the forest had the clearest inklings as to what had happened and what really lay beyond the thorny wood. And as they sat around their fires on cold winter nights, 
they would weave these inklings and imaginings into strange and magical tales of a beautiful princess who would sleep for 100 years. Now because these tales were so close to the truth, they were loved by almost all who heard them, and in time they spread far and wide. Many young men who sought adventure came and tried to hack their way through the entangled wood in order to settle the matter once and for all. But it was not the destiny of such men to penetrate the wood. And despite their fine weapons, many got hopelessly caught and trapped within the thicket and were never seen again. Yet as the hundred years drew to a close, a young prince of gentle nature stopped to rest at the cottage of a very old woman who had lived at the edge of the forest since she was a child. After she had fed the young prince, she sat down and began, as was custom in her family, to tell the tale of the forest of thorn and the sleeping beauty who lay therein. And as the prince listened to the old woman's tale, he felt it had run deep in his veins for all his life and he knew instantly and without doubt that he must find and awaken the sleeping girl. He ran outside toward the forest and to his complete astonishment found that all the buds on the trees had burst into full bloom and that a pathway lay open before him. He waved goodbye to the old woman and set off on his way. When at last he reached the palace, he found every living thing asleep. The horses were asleep in the stables, the dogs in the yard and the flies on the walls. Inside the palace it was just the same. In the kitchens the servants slept soundly as they stood. And in the great hall, the king and queen, with all their guests around them, resembled a fine array of colourful clockwork toys, poised and waiting for time to ripen. Yet there was no sign of the sleeping princess. The prince searched every room in the palace, but he did not at any moment let doubt enter his heart. And when he had searched the entire palace, he went out into the gardens, and there his attention came to rest upon the ivy-clad tower where the princess lay. Sensing her presence, he began to climb the dusty spiral staircase. When he reached the top, he paused for a moment as the girl had done before him. Then slowly, he pushed open the old wooden door. Inside the tiny room, he saw the sleeping girl. He knelt down beside her and looked at her sleeping face. How beautiful she was, even now as she slept. Yet she would be ever more beautiful, he knew, when the sparkle of wakefulness returned. The young prince then leaned toward her and kissed her forehead lightly. And as he did so, she opened her eyes and became fully awake.
And in that same moment, the spell cast at the princess's christening party had run its course. The sun brightened the skies and the forest of thorn vanished. At last, the hundred years were done. Every living thing stirred and stretched and awakened from sleep. The flies buzzed about their business, the dogs began to bark, the horses carried on eating the grass they had started so long ago. The servants were back at work in a flash, and the birthday guests resumed their conversations as if nothing had happened. The king berated the queen for falling asleep on her throne not realising that he had done the same. Yet the Queen paid no heed to him, for her mind was elsewhere, remembering the words of the Twelfth Fairy at her daughter's christening party. Death will not claim her, so dry your tears. Instead she will sleep for one hundred years. And as the Queen began to sense what had happened, her daughter arrived in the Great Hall with the Prince who had awakened her. There was great excitement when the Prince asked to marry the Princess, and a splendid wedding celebration was immediately arranged. The palace was festooned with garlands, the bells rang out in the church, and the finest musicians and dancers were called to entertain the new king and queen. And when all the celebrations were done, the young girl journeyed with her husband to a far distant land, where of course they lived.